Today's program features. Thank you. I am delighted, obviously, to be here. Sorry about being a little bit late. Um, all these great places you're talking about, uh, as an example, Africa, Hamburg, Cozumel, those are great places to go and visit and do good work. Uh, just by a show of hands, if you had to choose between Africa, Hamburg, Cozumel, or North Korea, how many of you would choose North Korea? May I see you right there? I see one brave or ignorant soul. On Either way, it'll work out just fine. Almost daily, I think you know, we hear about the strategic threat posed by North Korea. Uh, many may not be trying to get this in the right place. Does this thing, does they thing all right now? Okay, it's too much. Yeah. Uh, many may not realize that more than 20 million people live under some of the most horrible conditions in the world, and representatives from the George W. Bush Institute will talk about their work on North Korea, which focuses on raising awareness about the human rights situation in the country and a unique new program to assist the small community of North Korean refugees that have settled in the United States. And I told them I, I suspected that there will be some questions from you, and some of those questions will probably be, do you have the sense of whether President Trump and President Kim are good buddies? Um, is the nuclear situation totally defused? And what's the situation that's going to solve the Korean Peninsula crisis? I'm sure they're ready for those questions, and I'm also not sure that they have all the right answers that you'd like to hear. But they are experts in this part in terms of the human rights. And I'm going to introduce them both, but I'm going to introduce them in the reverse order which they're speaking. Jian Pion is a manager for Human Freedom Initiative at the George Bush Institute. She's primarily responsible for development and implementation of the Liberty and Leadership Forum, an innovative educational and training program that equips young leaders with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed during a democratic transition. The program currently engages young leaders from Burma, which is Myanmar today. And the first speaker, however, uh, who you'll uh, acknowledge to start with is Lindsay Lloyd. He's a deputy director of the Human Freedom Initiative at the George W. Bush Institute, where he manages original research and programmatic efforts to advance freedom and democracy in the world. Lindsay currently leads the Bush Institute's Freedom in North Korea project, which raises awareness of human rights violations in North Korea, proposes new policy solutions, and engages leaders to help improve the lives of North Korean people. He's also responsible for managing the Freedom Collection, a multimedia archive that documents the stories of nonviolent freedom advocates from around the world. So they will live, uh, leave plenty of time for questions. Please help me welcome to start, Lindsay Lloyd, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my colleague and I are really grateful for the invitation to be here today. Um, I think, Dennis, thank you for your introduction. It, it sort of gave a little preview here. We have a really uplifting topic today, North Korea. I mean, what could be a sunnier conversation than that? Um, I'll give you just a couple of words about the Bush Institute. Um, first of all, we're grateful for the partnership that we have working on veterans issues with you. Our military services initiative is, is really proud to partner with you, and we're looking forward to seeing that bear fruit in the coming months. Um, I hope many of you have been to visit the Bush Center, just up 75 a few miles. Um, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary in the building. Could you raise the mic up a little closer to your face? Yeah, I will do that. Is some that of us are some of us older guys are a little hard to hear. I hear you. <laughs> um, we've been uh, the the Bush Center opened in 2013 on the campus of SMU, so we just had our uh, fifth anniversary this spring. There are two halves to the building. The front half is the museum which is owned by the National Archives, uh, belongs to all of you collectively, has the records from President Bush's time in the White House as well as uh, Governor of Texas. On the back side of the building where June and I work, we have what's called the George W. Bush Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan institute that focuses on the policy priorities of George and Laura Bush throughout their careers. So we have both domestic and international programs. June and I work on our, what we call our global uh, programs, but we also have programs to focus on education, uh, on military service, on veterans, post 9 11 veterans in particular who've come back and help them with their transition, on economic growth, how do we create the conditions for prosperity in the United States and especially here in Texas. Internationally, we also have programs uh, that are working to strengthen the role of women, particularly in the Middle East, so trying to cultivate and develop women leaders in places like Tunisia and Egypt and Afghanistan. 
Uh, and we also have a really in innovative program called the Presidential Leadership Scholars that we do in partnership with the Clinton <coughs> Center, with the George H.W. Bush Library, and the LBJ Library down in Austin. Where each year we take a group of about 60 mid-career professionals, and they learn uh, lessons about leadership from those four administrations. So it's a really unique project. It's an example of something we don't see all that often these days, which is really bipartisan cooperation, something we're really proud of. Um, so I will, I will transition uh, to North Korea here. It's part of our broader human freedom work. Uh, and when we say human freedom, we're talking about democracy and human rights. Uh, we do that by developing leaders, so trying to impart skills, leadership techniques, and so forth to up-and-coming leaders, like the program my colleague works on, where we're working with young people from Burma, a country that's trying to make a democratic transition. So working with journalists and young politicians, with leaders of NGOs and so forth, and giving them the kind of skills and the kind of education they need to succeed and help transform their country to democracy. Um, we also work to stand with people who are living under tyranny. The, uh, the program I'm going to talk to you about, our <coughs> career program, is probably the best example of that. Uh, but it's obviously been a passion for President and Mrs. Bush for many years over the course of their careers, and it's something we try and uh, continue these days. And then thirdly, we try and uh, argue for policies that support American leadership on these issues. We believe that it's important, that it's vital for the United States to lead on issues of democracy and human rights around the world. Uh, because we, we have a lot to give, and we know from historical experience that we can make a positive difference in the world. So on North Korea, um, it's pretty hard to pick up a newspaper or turn on the television these days without seeing something about North Korea. It seems to accelerate. The news seems to get faster and faster and faster. Um, most of the time when you're hearing about North Korea, though, it's because of the strategic threat, the nuclear threat. Um, that's obviously incredibly important, um, but increasingly I think we're also seeing a focus on human rights in North Korea, and that's where I want to really focus my, my remarks to you today. Um, earlier this year we had the Olympics in South Korea, the Winter Olympics there, and we saw, saw the spotlight uh, really start to focus on Korea in general, North and South. Um, the, those Olympic Games were just 50 miles south of the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. There are a lot of fears that North Korea might try to disrupt those games in some ways as they've done in the past. When uh, South Korea hosted the Summer Olympics back in the 80s, the North Koreans did everything they do, they could do to sort of derail those games and failed, uh, fortunately. This year we saw something kind of different. We saw a mini detente breakout uh, between a, a newly elected South Korean president and a relatively new uh, leader in North Korea, um, an attempt to sort of forge a new relationship, a new detente between the two countries. Um, they invited North Korea to participate, and after a lot of back and forth, indeed, the North Korean athletes did come to those Winter Games at a joint team, which was kind of unusual. Uh, we saw the dictator's sister appear in the stands cheering on, uh, cheering on the North Korean teams. And then that led to a series of meetings uh, between the, the South Korean President Moon and the North Korean dictator Kim. Um, we had that first meeting in the DMZ. Now they're talking about another one in September, I believe, probably in North Korea. And you're starting to see talks. Just this week, there was uh, an ability for family reunification. You think about the Koreas have been separated for 70 years. Their families that haven't seen each other in 70 years, um, and obviously not a lot of not a long time horizon when you're dealing with you know people at that age. So we saw these family reunions and so forth. Then we had the big news from Singapore, where for the first time ever, a, seat, a, a seated American, a sitting American president, met with the, the leader of North Korea. Uh, in a summit meeting, you have the Secretary of State, uh, Pompeo, who's been to South Korea, I think, three times now, maybe four, something like that. So there's a, there's a dialogue happening. Why? Because the Korean War has never officially ended. We're 70 years past it, and yet there's still never been a peace treaty, there's still never been a final settlement. Um, and we are still technically at a state of war with, with North Korea. Um, we at the Bush Center believe that, you know, disengagement is good, it's important, um, and, it, and it should continue. We've got to do everything we can to see if we can, you know, we can reach some sort of a peaceful uh, accommodation with with the North. I'm a little skeptical on that, but I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. So in terms of what we're doing at the Bush Center on North Korea, we started this project in 2014, so about four years ago. Um, 2014 was an interesting year for a couple of reasons. First of all, when President Bush was in office, he signed a law called the North Korean Human Rights Act in 2004. So 2014 was the 10th anniversary of that. What that did is it created a pathway for North Korean refugees to come to the U.S. It provided a little bit of funding for projects to try and improve information inside North Korea. 
and it created a special office inside the State Department, a uh, special envoy for North Korean human rights. So part of our, our, our reason for getting into this line of work was to, to mark that anniversary. Mm -hmm. Um, there was also something kind of unusual. Some of you may be a little skeptical about the UN and the role that it plays, but the UN did something really vital in 2014. They had what they called the Commission of Inquiry, which was a body that, that was created specifically to look at the issue of human rights in North Korea. And what they did is they came out with a, a thick report where they had talked to uh, people who had escaped about their experiences there and really documented the kind of human rights abuses that are going on. So the first time the UN had done that about just one country. Um, and it was, it, you know, for, for those of you who may be lawyers, it was essentially an indictment. Um, it, it laid out a set of charges and it held, it holds the North Korean leadership responsible for them by name. So in some cases it will name prison guards or generals and so forth that are guilty of human rights abuses with the hope that someday they'll be brought to justice. Um, the other, you know, another reason why we wanted to get involved in North Korea, this is a rare issue that's not a partisan one. If you talk to congressmen or senators in Washington, uh, there's no Democratic or Republican position on North Korea. There's no liberal or conservative position, really. There's a, there's a strong unity on this, which makes it, I think, a really good space for us to work. Um, so what we wanted to do was raise awareness, put this issue on the radar screen of more people. We wanted to um, make sure the American people knew what was going on in North Korea as well, and then try and develop some policies, some ideas on, on what do we do about this problem. It's a tough, tough problem. So we've done different types of research. We've done several studies uh, about the issue. We've studied uh, the North Korean refugees who are here in the US. Who are they? How are they doing? Things like that. We've done some polling. We surveyed Americans. What do they know about North Korea? What do they think about North Korea? The short answer to that is they don't know a whole lot, but they don't like it. Um, but it was interesting to hear how people perceive North Korea. And different, uh, more kind of think tank activities, writing policy papers. Uh, holding conferences, different events, things like that, again, to sort of raise awareness to try and lift these issues up. Um, so why North Korea? Well, as you heard, more than 20 million people are living in, under, under some of the worst conditions on Earth there. Um, the widespread human rights violations, we think of it as the worst place on Earth in terms of human rights. Uh, in, in, since World War II, North Korea has been ruled by what's essentially the world's first communist monarchy, three generations of the Kim family, held absolute control over the country. Um, as June will get to a little bit of this, but you know, just briefly, after World War II, Korea was divided. Um, you had the Korean War from uh, 1950 to 1953, and then this stalemate, uh, this, this not so cold, cold war between the two sides you know, for all those decades since. North Korea is a place where famine uh, between 1994 and 1998 killed two to three million people. And it, the family was made worse, not better, by the actions of the government, which took the limited resources that were available and made sure they went to the favored elites, to the military, to the generals, to the, the, uh, the communist elites there. It's a place where there's no freedom of speech, there's no freedom of association, there's no freedom of assembly, there's no freedom of relig religion. You can be executed if you're found to carry a Bible. Um, there's no rule of law, there's no due process. It's illegal to leave the country. Most North Koreans can't even move within their country without position from the state. And it's where the state determines what you're gonna do. It's gonna determine whether or not you get to go to college, what career, what trade you might uh, be allowed to pursue. Uh, so it's really, it's really a uniquely awful place uh, in a world that unfortunately has quite a few awful places. Um, The, the, the way that the North Korean system works, they have a, they have a term called Songbun, um, which means that the government rates you according to how loyal or disloyal they perceive you to be. Again, this determines what kind of job, what kind of apartment or, or housing you might have. Um, it's a place where it's illegal to listen to a foreign radio station, to watch a foreign DVD, to, uh, to read foreign newspapers or, or material like that. 100 to 200,000 people are kept in political prison camps around the country uh, under horrible conditions. They've, they've rightly be, been compared to Soviet gulags or even the Nazi concentration camps. It's a place where if you commit a political crime, not only will you be prosecuted for it, but also your parents, your children, your siblings will all collectively go to jail. So there are children uh, who are living in concentration camps and political prison camps in North Korea. Um, and if you needed any more evidence about how North Korea is messed up, just think about some of the headlines we've seen over the last year. In uh, 2017, you had the assassination of Kim Jong-nam, who was the half-brother of the dictator in the airport in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. 
Uh, many of you may remember that, where he was poisoned uh, with, with a, a highly, highly toxic nerve gas in an airport. Um, Kim Jong-il, uh, Kim Jong the previous dictator, uh, executed his uncle. Um, the, uh, one of the, uh, the, the Kim family people was best known for traveling to Tokyo Disneyland using a fake Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic passport. North Korea has tried to break into Western banks to commit uh, cyber robbery, essentially. Uh, we had the torture and death of Otto Warmbier, that young student from uh, the University of Virginia last year. Um, and news reports about how North Korea is uh, doing its level best to hack into different systems. Um, you may remember the Sony hack a few years ago when uh, there was a movie that came out called The Interview that mocked the dictator. Uh, and uh, North Korea was able to bring down some of the computer systems at, at Sony. And then you have the whole strategic threat. Um, North Korea has been working to aggressively develop weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them. Uh, since 2009, there have been something like 60 tests of nuclear weapons or missiles. Um, we knew about a year ago that they, with some confidence, they could reach the West Coast, that they could reach Alaska or California, Oregon, and Washington. We now believe they probably have the capacity to reach anywhere in the United States. We don't know with what kind of accuracy, but does it really matter if they, lob a, uh, if they were to lob a nuclear missile our way, uh, whether it's a direct hit or not, it would still be a catastrophe. Um, the Pentagon believes that they have the technology now to militarize, uh, to miniaturize uh, these weapons, which is very important, be able, being able to deliver more uh, power through these missiles and so forth. Here's the thing. None of this activity has stopped, despite the conversations that have happened with, uh, with the United States, with South Korea. There are regular news reports about how North Korea is still working on these issues. There's been no stop, and that is uh, something I think that is of critical importance. Um, it's enough to kind of make you want to throw your head up or bury your head in the sand. It's, you know, what do you do about a problem like this? But we can't do that. It's too important. Um, each one of the last four administrations, American administrations, has tried in some way to deal with North Korea. And that unfortunately, all of those talks have ultimately ended in failure. So we've got to hope that things are a little different this time, that things will go a little better. There's sort of a pause. There's, a, there's an agreement that may or may not ever get fully executed. Within a year, they tend to collapse. Um, two things have changed, though, and I think make it an interesting and, and perhaps uh, more optimistic time to be talking to North Korea. First of all, North Korea is no longer being ignored. It's on the front burner. Um, for many years, this was just kind of an issue that was out there. It was a nuisance, but it wasn't something that was in the headlines every day as it is now. And secondly, human rights, I believe, are becoming more and more important in how people perceive North Korea and what, what they, they do about it. Um, we've seen raised awareness in Congress, and um, both in the Obama administration and now in the Trump administration, You've seen economic pressure ratchet up in, in really dramatic ways. <laughs> the sanctions that we have are the toughest that they've ever been. I would argue that they're still not tough enough. You still see big gaps where China, in particular, is keeping the, the North Korean regime afloat. Um, China's the, the Achilles heel here. It's, it's really North Korea's only friend in the world. South Korea could potentially fill that role. That's something that actually we're concerned about. Does South Korea start to uh, offer economic credits and so forth to try and try and improve things. But the, the reason why we think human rights is so important, a state that, that violates human rights uh, norms, human rights standards and so forth, that won't keep its word on those sort of issues, can we really trust them to honor a treaty that, that abolishes nuclear weapons or that uh, provides for security? I don't think we can. So it, it, human rights really gets to the nature of the North Korean regime, and um, it's it's why we re we need to focus there. Some things are changing, though. There's more information getting into North Korea than ever before, uh, through a lot of different ways. There are organizations that <coughs> drop USB drives and uh, DVDs and compact discs and other 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 things like that through hot air balloons that fly over North Korea. You've had um, black markets develop in North Korea, which are increasingly tolerated and increasingly a part of the economy, a really important part of the economy. People may go there to buy rice, to buy vegetables or fruit, but they're also trading information. And it's the first institution inside North Korea that's sort of outside the purview of the state. So that's potentially, I think, a very, very important development. Um, the other phenomenon I think that's interesting is we know more about what's happening inside North Korea than we ever have before. We don't know everything, but we know a lot more. One of the reasons we do is because of refugees who are coming out. So I'm going to show a, a short, uh, short video that talks about refugees, how they get out, 
and then I'll, I'll close with a few words about what the Bush Institute is doing to support them. North Korea is the least free place on Earth. The Kim regime controls every aspect of society, forcing its people to live under tyranny and in desperate poverty. Survival is a struggle, so some risk everything to escape in search of a better life. They begin a perilous journey, usually through China, where human traffickers prey on escapees, especially women. And if caught, the police send them back to North Korea to face possible imprisonment or execution. Some make their way to freedom via Southeast Asia. From there, most find sanctuary in South Korea, but some come to the United States as refugees where they face challenges adjusting to their new lives. They want to integrate into the culture, get an education, and be productive citizens. Supporting refugees helps them build new lives, enables them to help those they left behind, and brings all North Koreans closer to freedom. Okay, so have any of you ever met a North Korean? One back there? Hopefully under good circumstances. <laughs> so I, I don't know if you're aware, we have a small population of North Koreans that have come to the United States as refugees, only a couple hundred. Um, there are about 200 to 250 that have come as refugees, as you, as you heard in the film. Many more have gone to South Korea for obvious reasons, the language, they may have family ties there. Um, but we have a small community of North Koreans that, that are living with us here. There are a few hundred more that are, are uh, relatives, that may be children, some of them born here in the U.S. and so forth. So maybe 500 total, four to 500 total. Uh, believe it or not, the State Department does not keep good records on this kind of thing. Uh, you'd think they might want to, but they don't. Um, one of the reasons is they, uh, the refugees we know, um, but others who may have gone to South Korea and then come here later, they're just, they're, uh, they're categorized as being South Koreans. But we believe there are about 500 here. There's no one city where there's a, a, a North Korea town. Um, they're spread all over the United States. We have a handful living here in, in, in Texas, um, fewer than 10, we believe. Uh, most of them tend to be in places where you already have a large Korean-American community, in places like Orange County or the Bay Area in California, outside of Washington, D.C., in uh, New York, New Jersey, places like that. Um, it's an incredibly risky, incredibly difficult journey um, to get out of North Korea into China. Once they're there, as you heard in the, in the film, they face the risk of being sent back. The only way to get out, really, for them is to make a almost 2,000-mile journey overland through China from the north, north uh, east corner all the way down to the southern border um, to places like Vietnam and Burma and so forth to get out. What we did is we, we uh, wanted to know more about these people, so we did a study. We, we did interviews with them. Who are they? Where are they? How are they doing? Some, some really interesting things came out. First of all, they're mostly women. Um, most of the refugees who've come out are women. Um, women tend to be the leaders in at least North Korean families in June. South Korean families do. Mostly, yeah. Um, they, um, they are generally doing okay. Um, they are working. They're not on public assistance. Very, very few of them are, are, are taking uh, public assistance and so forth. They're not necessarily working in, in high profit jobs or, or you know, big career jobs, um, but they are supporting their families. They're getting support from the Korean community, the Korean American community here. Any refugee who comes to the U.S. gets six months of support from the government and then they're done. And that's all administered through private charities, uh, groups like Catholic Charities, the International Rescue Committee and so forth. So after that six months, they're, it's basically sink or swim. You're on your own. Um, and that's where um, this new program for us came into, in, into uh, play. We learned that one of the, the deepest desires among the refugees are, who are here is to improve their education, uh, particularly for, for younger people, for, for the children of refugees and so forth, to kind of get on that, that ladder uh, towards prosperity and towards success. So we set up a scholarship committee. Uh, we partnered with Korean Americans around the country, raised about $300,000 and established a, a North Korea refugee scholarship program that, that kicked off last year. So far we've given away 18 grants um, for 
people that are going to community colleges, to four-year universities, uh, to grad school, uh, in one case, studying things like political science and accounting and nursing and uh, divinity school and so forth, just to help these people get get a, a foot onto that ladder. Um, we have just uh, just now are kicking off a new mentorship program where we're going to pair these North Korean refugees with people who can kind of be either a professional or a life coach, depending on the, on the needs of the individual. Uh, you know, it would be a would be doctor being paired with a doctor, that kind of thing. Uh, but also just just kind of serving as a friend, just <laughs> serving as a, you know, as I say, a life coach, somebody to sort of advise like that. So it's a you know we think it's a it's a really exciting program. Um, the the reality of North Korea is somewhat bleak, um, but we also feel that these refugees are really one of the bright spots. Um, they are the future of that country. On that day when North Korea's dictatorship finally ends, as we believe it will, these are people who are going to be the future leaders. Um, many of them express the desire to go back. Many of them are serving in different ways, um, trying to help <coughs> those they left behind, either by raising awareness, by in some cases sending uh, sending funds or supplies in, and so forth. So we really think it's important to help these people transition to our society, uh, to be to be uh, successful, happy, prosperous Americans, but also for the reasons they're able to give back um, to their country. I'm going to uh, call on my my colleague June just to say a couple words, kind of give you her perspective as someone who was born and grew up in South Korea, kind of about how Koreans view this issue, and then after she speaks, we'll be happy to take any of your questions. So I appreciate your attention. June. Thank you, Lindsay. It's always difficult to go after Lindsay because he's such a great speaker and uh, it has lots of information. So I don't know if I can add anything more. But I know one thing that I can add here is I was born and raised in South Korea, the southern part of South Korea, small town called Dangang. And it's uh, um, famous for tomato farming. And my mom owns a small bedding shop and she is proud to Rotary International Women's Club. So so uh, I still remember uh, that um, in my in our living room there is the photo of her, the ladies in our small town wearing this Korean traditional dress with big banner in the back side saying Women Rural International. And so I'm taking this as a souvenir for my mom <laughs> for my next visit to uh, Korea. So thank you so much for inviting me today. So one thing that I think I can add to Lindsay's point is how these two countries are separated. So many people know um, the critical conditions in North Korea today, but not many people know how these two countries um, separated from the first place. So I will just give you a brief summary of the history and then also share a little bit about the South Korean perspective on this issue. So during Japanese colonization, um, um, Korean nationalists arose hoping to regain independence from Japan. So some people went to China and associated with communists uh, seeking for help, and some people went to Western countries like United States to look for support. And uh, after uh, World War II, Japan was defeated and Korea gained independence. But we, we, we had this power vacuum in the Korean Peninsula. So uh, to fill the vacuum in Korea, United States and Soviet Union reached such lush agreement uh, to separate the country in a half and leave uh, northern part of the country under Soviet control and the southern part of the country under U.S. control, U.S. influence, I will say, not country, U.S. influence and uh, northern part of the country under Soviet influence. So uh, Soviet left uh, communist Kim Il-sung in charge of the country and U.S. and other Western countries left um, uh, anti-communist Lee Seung Man uh, in charge of the country. So, uh, so in in so there has been some uh, um, the negotiations between North and South. Uh, Kim Il Sung and Lee Seung Man tried to form one unified two government, but all the negotiations have failed. And around after about three years later, in 1948. Um, 
the recent month in South declared formation of Republic of Korea, uh, claiming jurisdiction of entire Korean Peninsula. And about 25 days later, uh, Kim Il Sung in North Korea declared formation of North Korea, claiming again jurisdiction of entire Korean Peninsula. So now you have these two very different uh, government mm -hmm. claiming for uh, entire country as a representative government. So after three years, uh, af and after 25 days later, Kim Il-sung uh, declared the country. And then about two years later, um, communist North Korea, backed by Chinese and Soviet, uh, launched attack in South Korea. That's the beginning of the Korean War. And Korean War was about three years. And after these three years of devastated war, um, um, demonstrated were that the peace treaty, the armistice treaty signed between uh, China, North Korea, and United Nations. So, um, so since then, South and North Korea are technically still at war. So the peace treaty never signed. And it's one of the things that North Korea government <coughs> is asking to, for the United States and um, the international community to sign. Uh, but uh, so, so technically, we are still at the middle of the world. And the only separation between North and South Korea is about two and a half miles long DMZ demilitarized zone, which is one of the most heavily fortified uh, border in the in the world today. So as Lindsay mentioned, since then two countries uh, developed in very different ways. In the beginning, North Korea's development was faster than South Korea. So the country in the 1970s was richer than South Korea. But right now, South Korea is 11th largest economy in the world, but North Korea still remains as one of the most isolated country in the world. So it is it is it is tough situation, and you heard about North Korean refugees uh, escaping North Korea. But uh, eighty percent of North Korean defectors carries poison with them in case of they get captured in 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 China. They rather kill themselves than um, send it back to North Korea, where they will face execution and political prison camp. So that is the situation that uh, North Korean people is uh, having today. So as South Korean, um, as, as somebody um, born and raised in South Korea, it is painful for me to see that 24 million people are suffering um, and denied their basic human rights. They, uh, is, it is hard for me. There's a days that I just sit in my room and thinking about these people carries poison uh, to themselves, to kill themselves. Um, it is it, it, it's, it's something that is really difficult and personal to me as well because they're the exact same people who speak the same language just like me and who um, share the same history, part, same part of history just like myself. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, hard for me to see that they're, um, they're their uh, difficulties in North Korea. So um, as, we, as I said, South Korea is a place uh, where people enjoy the freedom. And ultimate goal for all South Korean is to see that North Korean people, like all Koreans, whether you're from North or South, to enjoy this um, freedom as well. So. Um, People are, in general, uh, happy about the recent development with North Korea, um, in North Korean relations. People think uh, talking is better than fighting. So we are happy to see that at least we are not in a situation to worry about North Korea's next provocation, provocations, uh, nuclear test. Um, but uh, we are staying uh, cautiously optimistic about this situation because this is not the first time that we thought that North Korea is serious about uh, change. So if you, um, I get asked time to time that whether crisis is real, whether there is fear for South Koreans. And I say fear is definitely there. Because if you think about how many provocations that we experienced in South Korea, even as recently in 2017 and 2016, 
just under these two years, we had provocations, whether it was actual casualty or nuclear test or missile test, we had um, some sort of provocation from North Korea twice a month. So every uh, twice a month, you hear some uh, some sort of this North Korea's um, military actions. So fear is there, but is what is interesting is uh, people. Of when people see how close Seoul is from North Korea and uh, how South Korea were able to have this um, vibrant democracy but also big economy and ca capital like Seoul, which is only less than one hour, two hours from the border on uh, TMZ. It's, a, it's a surprising to see that, right? How can you have your capital city that close to North Korea where you hear about all this uh, crazy news all the time? And also when there is provocation from North Korea, market doesn't change much in South Korea too. So what you can say from here is fear is there, but people are so used to this kind of fear. We lived under this kind of uh, condition for more than six decades now. So as I said, people are remain uh, optimistic, um, but cautiously optimistic about what is going on. And uh, I'm, I, we will see in terms of Korean, uh, North Korean policy, uh, South Korea's policy toward North Korea, we will see more engagement policy given than the popularity of this liberal president Moon Jae-in in South Korea today. And this president, uh, this government inherits um, the policy, uh, Kim Dae-jung, President Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy, which is comprehensive engagement policy. So we will see South Korean government continue to try to engage North Korea in many different ways. But what is different this time from Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy was uh, North Korea now have nuclear. So before then, North Korea was trying to have a nuclear, but this time we are working on the denuclearization. And the sanction, international sanction, is tougher than ever. So it will be difficult, even though South Korean government wants to engage North Korea, it will be difficult to get agreement from international community to lift the sanction unless North Korea shows a significant step toward denuclearization, which is good news for us, too. But uh, this is my, my short sense about what is going on, and I'm happy to take any questions from you all. Stay right, stay right here. Lindsay, if you want to come up, too. We just have a few minutes, but we do have some time for questions. Tom, why don't you go so I, first? I'd like to hear your vision of what you think is going to be 10 years from now, and, and what's possible, and what would be a few yeah, to repeat the question is, is what, what, what they see is a vision for 10 years from now. Which one of you would like to take that on? Um, I, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I can, I can tell you what the vision is, and it's what June just talked about. It's, it's a place where all Koreans, regardless of which side of the 38th parallel they live on, are living in conditions of prosperity and freedom. Um, the best way to do that is through peaceful reunification uh, under the southern terms, not the northern terms, and that, I think, ought to be the ultimate policy goal for the United States is a peacefully re reunited, democratic, prosperous Korea. Okay, Hubert? Uh, I, I read the book, The uh, Escape from Camp for, uh, 14, 14 right? mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so it paints the picture of what happens in these camps, and I, I know you touched upon it, but are there any particular things you could comment on that book or on the actual plight? I mean, it is <coughs> so sinister that it is really hard to describe. Yeah, to repeat the yeah, question. The question was about uh, conditions inside the camps in North in North Korea. The book was was mentioned, the escape from Camp 14, which is a very good book. It's by a young uh, North Korean man named Shin Dong Hyuk, who now lives in Denver with his American wife and son, uh, and a journalist from the Washington Post named Blaine Harden. It's a really good account. The conditions are awful. Um, his book, other books out there, detail. You, it really, the, you know, I mentioned the parallels to the concentration camps uh, of Nazi Germany, to the gulags of the Soviet Union. The, the conditions are awful. We know much more about them today than we ever did because of defectors like Shin, uh, because of satellite photography and things like that, but uh, just horrible, horrible conditions. Um, and for that reason, if for no other, we need to keep the economic pressure on the North Korean regime. Okay, back there at the back. 
Joaquin. Yeah, guys, thanks again for, for coming and sharing your stories. Let's assume for a moment that Kim Jong-un wants to normalize relations and wants to end the dictatorship. Practically speaking, can he? Does he have that power to do it? The yeah, the question is sort of on the, you know, does, it, can we take Kim Jong-un and his word? Does he really want to change things? And could he, uh, if he wanted to? I, I think it's extremely precarious for him to do that. The only reason the Kim uh, regime has retained power the way they have is because of this system of absolute loyalty and by keeping things closed. As we know now, North Korea increasingly is opening up, cracks here, cracks there. And the more that happens, the more it's a threat to the regime. I th in my mind, I think the most likely thing to happen if, if, if Kim were to go away is probably not an immediate flowering of democracy like we saw in Central and Eastern Europe uh, 25, 30 years ago, but it's a military regime. Um, that the, the generals uh, who are going to be eager to preserve their power, their role in society, are the most likely sort of successor regime. Um, and that, that could be okay, actually. That could lead to a more rational government that might ultimately transition to something better. But, uh, you know, Kim has loyalty, we believe, but it's really hard to know that if, if people were no longer uh, under the, the barrel of a gun, are they still going to be loyal to this kind of regime? I think not. Last question. Steve, uh, Steve do you have your hand up? We know a little bit about what President Trump has proposed in terms of trying to sketch out for Kim Jong-un economic development <coughs> if they would be nuclearized. And so it seems to me there's a challenge between their need to preserve control and their desire for economic development. And if they have to choose between the two, where do you think they're likely to come down? Uh, I think they're likely to stick with control. Um, I think you've got a regime that has never held the rights of its people uh, as a priority for them. So faced with the choice of a you know, beautiful new casino complex on the coast, versus staying in power, I think they stay in power. Okay, I'm gonna give Jim the last comment. You can comment on any of those questions. What if you'd like to comment on so you have the last word, young lady? Um, the first question about what I want to see in next 10 years. As South Korean, I want to see what Lindsay described, but I also see that this in reality that can be difficult. Uh, we have 50, over, little over 50,000 uh, families who is separated in South Korea. A majority of these families are in 90s, uh, in their 90s. This means that there is not many people in South Korea, younger gen, among younger generation, who remembered one United States. Korea. So it will be difficult, more and more difficult for South Korean government even to pursue their engagement policy because people will, this younger generation will think about what about, what about the unification cost? Who's going to pick up on that bill? And uh, what is the benefit of us having unified Korea? It seems like such difficult to uh, help North Korea to catch up with our level of economy and the freedom. So it will be more and more difficult for South Korean to convince South, uh, South Korean government to convince South Korean young people. But it's certainly something that I want to see in the next 10 years. Okay, you guys stay right here. But give them a round of applause if you'll stay here. Um, and I would say, as, as Dana is coming up here, uh, I have, we actually found this young lady uh, last year, I guess it was, when we did a television program with her. And when she explained it, she did shortly there about how this thing came about. I mean, all the people in our television audience, and all we, I assume that many of you who may have watched it kind of went, I don't know. I didn't know that. Anybody feel like they didn't really know how that happened like we did? So if you figured that out, then you can sort of understand the rest of it. Then it's all yours. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you both for your presentation today. This has been very informative. We really appreciate it. And so we have a few gifts to give to you. Um, for each of you, we have a Rotary Club of Dallas history book. And they have actually been signed on the inside cover to personalize that for you. There's a little piece of Dallas history with the last 100 and eight years now, I think. So um, we, we're pleased to give you that. And then I also included for you, especially for your mom, uh, this is a flag from our club banner. Um, and so hopefully that is something special you can take back to your mom. And then there's one for you as well, Lindsay. And I also have to thank you guys for your presentation. We see what you're, ta what you're talking to us today about as making positive ripples of change 
throughout the planet. And so we're hopeful that you'll take this little crystal globe as a, as a reminder of your talk to us today and how important it was to us. So thank you both so much. Thank you once again. And if anybody wants to ask further questions, will the two of you be available for a few more minutes? Okay, thank you. Now, next week is the day we've been talking about, you guys. We are not having a lunch meeting next week. We are having our first fifth Wednesday dinner social. So, next Wednesday evening, from 6 to 9 p.m., we're meeting at this place here in North Dallas off uh, Preston Road called Cadeau. It's a French restaurant. If you've been there before, you already love it. Um, but for the price of your lunch, so for $25, you get really nice appetizers and your first drink included. So we hope that all of you will come. Please do RSVP so that we can make sure the room is set up because we do have a social agenda. So it's not a, a typical meeting, but we will be having an activity. And so we want to make sure we have enough materials for everyone. So please do RSVP. Kelly Ann Sutton was organizing this and she's arranged for some fun things for us to do. However, she unfortunately will not be able to be there with us because um, she's attending to a family emergency. And um, hopefully you all have had a chance to sign the card that's going around for her. Um, there's actually two cards going around. The first one's for Kelly Ann. Her father suffered an aneurysm on Monday, went to the ICU. So she's dealing with that and taking care of him. And then the second card, this is very sweet of you guys, is for my husband, Matt DeVance. We lost his grandfather um, on Thursday of last week. So he was a wonderful man, aged 92, World War II vet. So um, we buried him on Saturday, and the second card is going around for him. So thank you all for that. I know Matt and Kellyanne will be very grateful to receive your sentiments. Immediately following this meeting, we have a board of directors meeting. So everyone is welcome to join us. We do open our doors to anyone who's interested. We're meeting just right here down the hall at 1.15 or so. Thanks to all of our members for your attendance today and to all of our guests and those who tuned in on our live stream. While Rotary membership is by invitation only, someone thought very highly of you to tell you about us. So we hope you will consider joining us and inquire. I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Remember to share the gift of Rotary, be people of action, and continue to be the inspiration. Now, all fellow Rotarians, please stand and recite with me the things that we wish all people would think, say, and do. First, is it true? second, is it third, <laughs> and fourth, <laughs> And here at the Rotary Club of Dallas, we also have a fifth. Is it fun? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.